you're, you have a starting point and then there's the goal of the conclusion of a story, let's say. And you tend to steer off over here, over there. And then you're like, sometimes, well, wait, what were we talking about? You go there and then, oh, OK, let me go back to the goal. Because Did, you're trying to like fill in the blank on your own, like trying yes. to come up with the. So typically, well, typically they don't even think about the conclusion of the story. They think about what's the next step? What's the next step? What's the next step? So people who tend to be more neurotically oriented or creatively oriented, they tend to be inductive. They only think about the short term. What's the next thing I'm going to say? What's the next thing I'm going to say? However, people who are deductive, so they think end first. Oh, this is how I want to tell the story. This is the end goal I want to say. And then they work their way backwards and then they tell the story. So in a way, they already told a story in their head before they told a story. And that's the best way somebody can communicate very effectively and clearly and to the point, typically because they're deductive naturally. Yeah. So people, uh, people who have ADHD, for example, you tend to be inductive. So I, I get a lot of clients who are ADHD oriented because they tend to also have a low verbal fluency because they t tend to think, OK, what's the next thing I'm going to say? What's the next thing? And they don't start at the end first. So for you with the editing, if you can visualize it, because I can see in your brain, maybe you're visualizing it and you're like, OK, cut this out. Right. If you can visualize the end of your conversation first or the end of the point you're making, even if it's a 10 second point, if you can always think about it that way, maybe visually see it in your head, it's easier for you to have a straight communication process instead of veering off into different places. If that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Hey, if you just resonated with the clip just shown, then stick around because I'm going to take you through the skill set of thinking and speaking deductively. So I want to take a special thank you to Anya who DM me on Instagram about this saying, Hey, I'd love for you to do a video on inductive versus deductive and how to speak in deductive. So here it is. Stick around just so go through the symptoms of inductive thinking to make sure, is this you? <laughs> so if you have conversations and your mind tends to wander off as you speak, so maybe you just lose yourself as you speak, you might be an inductive thinker. Uh, your conversation often goes on side quests. So you, you start to talk about something completely irrelevant to the original story. And you say something that perhaps interests you more to tell. Uh, you forget what you were originally talking about. So maybe sometimes you go on these side quest conversations and then you forgot what the original point was or the original storyline was. You forget why you mentioned a story or tangent. So maybe you go off on something completely different and then you forgot why you were saying that in the first place. So you don't even know how to conclude that or how to end that point because you forgot what the point was in the first place, right? But then you also might forget where you are in a storyline as you're speaking. So maybe as you're talking about things, you forget what your point was in the first place. <laughs> so it makes for an awkward moment. You might be an inductive thinker and consequently an inductive speaker. This is very common in people who are creatively oriented. Uh, maybe if you have ADHD or any neurodivergency, memory issues can be a thing. You tend to think inductively. And then diabetes, I put in diabetes because uh, glucose spikes can affect the way you think and therefore communicate. So it's just something to note. These are two famous inductive thinkers and conversationalists. So I just wanted to say it's nothing good or bad, right? Because in inductive thinking, and speaking, you tend to create these wonderful songs, for example. You can think of wonderful business ideas, for example. But it's just a matter of when you use inductive versus when you use deductive conversation and speaking style. This is specifically for coders, but I particular found, particularly found this very helpful because ultimately how people code apparently is exactly the same thing as how we speak. So you'll see here inductive coding, it goes from theory to hypothesis, observation to confirmation. 
And then you'll see here in the note, it says best for the first round of analysis, determine tags as you go along, uh, lengthier process. So when you are speaking inductively, you tend to speak longer. If you were to tell a storyline in an inductive way, you start at the beginning first, and then you kind of figure out what the story plots and points or main points are as you go along until you end the point. And you try to remember as you tell the story, oh, wait, this is an important key piece. Oh, this, this happened as well. Actually, this is good context to know because I'm about to say, oh, this point. Oh, before I say this other thing, I need to give you a background story on the thing so you understand what the thing is in the first place. That is an inductive way of communicating. And this is, again, this is coming from an inductive person. So I know very well exactly how inductive uh, thinking and speaking is. And then deductively, you'll see here, it starts with information pattern key hypothesis and then going to theory so this is best for subsequent rounds of analysis especially when you're communicating professionally use predetermined set of tags that's interesting because people who are deductive tend to use predetermined set of frameworks which is what we're going to talk about and it's a quicker process because they're using predetermined set of frameworks and uh, way of conversation they already know from point one to two to three to four, it's all lined up and there's nothing that's giving it that buffer, so to speak, right? I'm just going to oversimplify deductive thinking. This is Brene Brown here, a famous deductive thinker, scientist, author. <laughs> I just love her so much. But anyway, it really just has to hit these three points. This is something that people tend to do subconsciously, but they think, what do I say? How do I go about saying it? And then taking a beat to simply think about those two things. That's it. That's really just it. Pro tip here though, the mistakes a lot of inductives make is that they tend to use filler words instead of taking a beat to think about what they're about to say. So I would suggest here that whenever you have to say something that has to be in a point A to B to C, take a beat, take a moment. It might be that you're afraid that somebody might cut you off while you're speaking, especially in a group dynamic, or if you're running a meeting, or if you're doing a presentation. But ultimately, if you build the cadence, especially if you're going to speak to the same people of whenever I speak, it's going to be something important. You're going to start to become more and more confident in your deductive way of speaking when it calls for it. So let's dive into it. Step number one is the three point framework. Again, this is very oversimplified, but let's get into it. I put this down into four different themes. There are definitely more than just these four, but these are the four main themes that you might hit when you're having a conversation, whether it's a storyline that you're telling a buddy of yours of, hey, guess what just happened? There's typically a beginning, a middle, and an end, simply put, right? Uh, process. This is probably at work when you're explaining to somebody step-by-step step what they need to do. So there's a problem, there's a solution to that problem, and then there's a result. Hypothesis, there's a claim that you're making, there's a justification of that claim, and then there's a conclusion. Sales, there's an opener, there's the pitch, and then there's a call to action. Hey, join this for $3.99, right? And so each of these have three main points that you really have to hit, keeping that in mind. Step two is think with the end first. Deductive thinkers, when they're in the thinking stage, they actually think in the end in mind and then they work their way backwards. Because believe it or not, it's a lot easier to do it that way. In a storyline, let's just say, hey, if I want to end in, oh, it was really embarrassing because the spaghetti spilled everywhere in the kitchen. What was the pivotal moment that made that happen would be my next question. Oh, what's the middle point? Well, she slipped and fell. What's the beginning point? Everything was good. We were in the kitchen just cooking spaghetti and we were so excited to eat that spaghetti. So now I naturally, because I began with the end first, 
I already know it's a lot easier to bullet point what points I need to make. Oddly enough, try it out. I promise you it's a thing. Same for each of these other things. If you can quickly train yourself to think about the end in mind first, it's a lot easier to then bullet point back. And the reason why we're going to do this is to go into step number three. We want to speak between the gaps. So taking the example of, let's say, the end, the spaghetti spilled everywhere in the kitchen, uh, the middle, so somebody slipping, right? In the beginning, everything was peaceful. Maybe there is a conflict in between everything was peaceful to somebody slipping. Did somebody randomly slip? Or were people getting chaotic? Oh, yes. Actually, Ashley was saying congratulations because Henry actually had a promotion and they were, they were oh, jumping up and down. And even though they were concentrating originally on making the spaghetti, all of a sudden they were rioting over this amazing thing. So now I'm adding context. Uh, and then while they were jumping and getting really excited, then Ashley slipped and fell <laughs> and then spaghetti was everywhere, right? So this is, uh, for example, this is a plot line. If you just Google plot uh, story, you'll see something like this and you can get really detailed with this, but I want to show you here that even though you can add more context in here, there's still a beginning, there's, there's still a middle and there's still an end. The three point framework still exists. You're just adding more inside there. Here's another uh, framework that is also a storyline. That's a little bit more complicated. This is called the hero's journey. Still act one would be the beginning, act two, middle, act three is the end. But within these, and this is a common movie storyline, right? It's the ordinary world, something's happening. They, they get a call to adventure. They refuse it. No, I'm not gonna do that thing. And then somebody convinces them, no, you actually should do that thing. And then they do the thing, right? They, they run into problems and issues. There's an ordeal. They finally get the thing. Uh, and then they go back to maybe their old world and they realize something. And then they get something, a reward that they didn't think was the reward that they originally wanted. Maybe it was an aha moment. Maybe it was a realization. And so that, again still a beginning, middle and end. And you're just adding more in between the gaps. The point I want to show you these is that you can make it as complicated or as simple as possible. It always goes back to this three point system, no matter what. Okay. But general rule of thumb without getting too complicated about it. And you can certainly look up different frameworks, but general rule of thumbs say it before you explain it, you want to say the thing before you explain an example. She couldn't open the door because it's actually a triangle door that for some reason, the mechanic, not the mechanic, but the person who made the door, they didn't like rectangles, right? So you want to say the thing first to sometimes give them the context itself versus explaining it. So the door has this weird shape. It's, it's actually really, really unusual. And you wouldn't believe what it is. Oh yeah, it's a triangle shape. Just say it's a triangle shape first. Right? Just say the thing first and then explain it. And then secondarily, just to move the story forward, is to say key words like, but, but, oh, well, Ashley was making a delicious spaghetti, but Henry announced that he just got a promotion. But then, Everybody was so excited. They started to jump up and down. Uh, then Ashley slipped and fell <laughs> because of that spaghetti was everywhere. So these are some uh, words that you can keep in the back pocket just to move the story forward for you. And then step number three is uh, speaking it out loud. These were actually, hey, let's think about the end and first. And when you're speaking between the gaps, it all goes down to, again, this three point system, simply put. Here's the thing. You can't always rely on the three point framework because sometimes there's not enough time to actually think about that. In that case, I suggest to think on your feet and train yourself to actually think on your feet. It's a brain process that I like to talk about. So if you're interested in that, click on this video right here. Otherwise, if you want further help from me, reach out. I'm here.